Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, this is gonna be the first class where we're actually talking about poker strategy, uh, so this should be pretty exciting. So the first thing we're gonna learn about is position, and this is only three slides long. So positions have different names. They're put into different groups, and a lot of how we describe what's going on in a particular hand is gonna be relevant to where people are sitting. Why? Because people in late position get to act after people in early position. And in general, the positions are broken into uh, four different groups. There are the blinds, who pay the blinds and are first to act and on every street after preflop. There's early position, middle position, and late position, where all these positions have, have, uh, have names except middle position. Where um, starting in the big blind, we call it under the gun, under the gun plus one, and under the gun plus two. You could also describe these as um, seat one, two, three, four, all the way to nine or 10, um, although I don't really like that because I think it's, they all have pretty unique names and they're descriptive enough to just use those. Um, so middle position is labeled one, two, and three. And then around the button, you describe uh, their relation to the button where either you are the button or you are cutting off the button. And then some people get a little crazy by calling this like the hijack. And, uh, but I, I tend to not do that. And then as we eliminate people, we get rid of the least interesting positions um, to only keep the ones with real names. Okay, so the reason that I'm telling you this now is we're gonna be going through hands where I talk about players by their position. Like the, per, the individual person doesn't matter, but it's much easier to understand what's going on when I refer to them as the cutoff or, or the button or whatever. But in general, the later position is better because you get more information. Like you get to see people acting before you. And as a result, you, like the, the money flows in, in general to the late positions. Like you're, the, the round that you're, the hand that you're the button, you're going to make the most amount of money. And you can see that in Poker Tracker. And if you're losing money on the button, you should seriously reevaluate how you're playing that because that's when you make the most amount of money. The blinds are in an interesting situation because they get to see the flop for a discount because they're compelled to, play, to pay um, some sort of bet. So you might think the blinds are in a good position because they get a free flop, but they're actually in a terrible position because when position matters post-flop, they are the first to act in every single situation. So even though you might think that you're getting a discount for being in the blinds, you're getting a discount, an entry into a hand where you're almost certainly gonna be at a major informational disadvantage. Um, however, interestingly, in short stack situations, early position is actually better because you have the opportunity to, um, to go all in before the other person does, and you maintain, um, you maintain the, the equity from aggression, the fold equity, which we'll talk about later. It's sort of like a game of chicken, where the, so chicken is a game where two people drive at each other until one person turns, where it's like a, a, an infinitely bad return if they both don't turn and then like one wins if one turns and one doesn't. So the proper strategy in chicken is to throw your uh, steering wheel out the window so the other person knows he only has one option if he doesn't want an infinitely big loss. So with position, it works very similar to that where if you're in a tournament where neither person wants to see a showdown, like neither person wants to um, deal with a coin flip for their tournament life, if you're in early position, you have the opportunity to be the aggressor and go all in. So you get to discourage the other person from entering into it. So let's move on to some basic concepts. So a lot of these things are, are based on odds. So poker is a statistical game and we're gonna be talking about um, applications of math to poker. So why does, so why does drawing matter? So drawing, drawing means you're trying to make a hand, like uh, more cards that will come out will give you a really good hand, whereas you don't necessarily have a good hand right now. And a really common situation, there's one guy that has an okay hand, and there's one guy that has nothing but the potential to have a really good hand. And a lot of, like most of the decision points come down to whether the, the guy with nothing has equity, like has an interest in making his real hand. Um, so really common examples of these are one person has a pair or two pair and one guy has a straight or flush draw. 
Someone, if we're talking pre-flop, someone has a pocket pair and someone else has literally anything else and they're trying to make anything more than whatever that guy's pair is. Um, so what the drawer has to do, the guy without a real hand, is to decide whether the bet he is facing or whatever he has to pay to see more cards to find out if he makes his hand is worth the, the cost, is worth, is worth what the, the aggressor is making him pay to see that additional card. And the person who has a hand already wants to make it so that the drawer cannot see his card for a positive equity. He wants to bet so much that a call is bad because that's where his equity comes from. So he can either bet enough so that he folds, the other guy folds, or bet enough that he'll call and make a huge mistake. Like both are equally good. Yeah. Actually, the second one is probably better. So I'm saying a drawer is someone who has a flush draw or a straight draw or basically has no real hand at showdown but has a reasonable chance of, as more cards come out, making a, a monster hand, like making a hand which will almost certainly win at showdown. Okay, so, so let's go through a, a scenario. Okay, so this seemed pretty straightforward. There was some sort of bet pre-flop. I called, and it was heads up. It came with four to a flush, four hearts, and this guy bet into me. And the question is, what do we do? That's a big question. And I'm going to be using this format a lot because it's easier to, at least for me, it's easier to see, and then hopefully it's um, something you guys will pick up on. I'm only going to include relevant information, and the cases are going to be written in this format where we have the relevant stacks up here. Here are the blinds. This means that small blind is 20, big blind is 40, and there's a 10 ante. This is a pot before anyone does anything. This is a pot as of the flop. These are my cards. The hero is whoever we care about. The villain is the other guy. Um, and this just shows the order of what happens. So here, he raises to 120 pre-flop, three big blinds, I call. The flop comes eight of hearts, three of hearts, something that doesn't matter. He bets 370 all in. Okay, so my decision is what do I need, like what can I do here? And this is a really common scenario. And what we can do is develop the tools that we need to make this, um, to figure out what we want to do here. And rather than should we call, we can come up with a much more resilient answer. Like what's the biggest bet that we can call? And we're going to end up with a solution set of this, of this area here. That's what we want to figure out. But first, we need to develop something called expected value. Um, so expected value is the same in poker as it is in math. It's just a probability weighted average of all possible results. So it's win percentage times win amount minus lose percentage times lose amount. Um, so in our scenario, we're going to add some variables into it. We're facing a bet into a pot of 380. Our, win, our EV is going to be the whatever chance we have to win uh, times the pot of 380 plus whatever the bet is, X, minus our lose percentage, which is 1 minus win percentage times that same variable, X. And our like, threshold for call is when EV equals 0. So um, pot odds is generally what we call the relationship between the size of the bet you're facing and the pot that you would win if you call that bet and then win the hand. So a, this is going to be the equation. So it's plus EV, it's positive expectation. If you're, the chance you have of winning is greater than the call amount divided by the size of the pot after the call. Okay, so say that we were, we were seeing a bet of 100. We were seeing a bet a little bit bigger than that, but just for example purposes, we'll use 100. So your pot odds would be 100 divided by 580, where 580 is whatever was in the pot before, plus his bet, plus your call. Like you will win 580 if you win this hand. So your call is contributing 17% uh, of the pot. Um, and just so you guys know, people use pot odds in a different way. They talk about like um, 
like one to four and use a different notation for referring to your chance of winning. I always thought this was very intuitive, so that's what I'm going to be teaching you guys. It's a percentage of the pot that you can contribute. Um, so if your win percentage is more than 17%, this is a plus CV call. And this should be fairly easy to, um, to wrap your head around. And your win percentage can just be calculated based on what cards will make you win divided by what cards are left in the deck. And those are called outs, like cards that result in a win, a win for you based on your best estimate are called an out. So when you're going for a flush, so there are 13 hearts, you already know about four of them, they're either in your hand or on the board, there are nine hearts left that you could hit to, to make your flush and presumably win. So your win percentage, this is calculating it out exactly, is just one minus your chance of hitting the flush on neither one of those cards. So it's 40 out of 49 times 39 out of 48, which is about equal to 34%. So since this 34%, our chance of winning is more than 70%, the proportion of the call that we're contributing, this makes it a good call. And the fact that this is really big compared to this makes it a really good call. So this is how I think of it in terms of visualizing it. So this whole, this whole pie is the $580 pot um, that it will be if you called. This chunk is your 34% pot odds. Now this, this chunk can be comprised of the size of the bet you're calling and your expected value from calling. So here, the size of the chunk is $197, which is 34% of 580. We can contribute up to that amount. If we get to contribute less of it, that means that any additional chunk is EV. Like we are making $97 for making this call. Um, similarly, if we make a call that's too big, we end up with a negative chunk of that pie. So I'm teaching you a quick rule for calculating your chance of winning any hand. Um, and the quick rule I'm gonna use is by uh, Phil Gordon. So let's talk about Phil Gordon. So Phil Gordon got, he seems like an okay guy. He got fourth place in the main event. He won a world poker tour. He won two bridge championships. He's the head referee of the World Series of Rock, Paper, Scissors. These guys get into really interesting things when they're not playing poker. And he's the author of Phil Gordon's Little Green Book. So Phil Gordon uh, invented this thing which caught on called Gordon's Rule of Two and Four, which basically just says each of your outs is worth 2% for each additional card you get to see for that size of bet. And it should be fairly obvious where 2% comes from. It's just one divided by 50. And it's a rough estimate of what, one, uh, what each out is worth over 49 or 48 or however many cards are left. If you get to see both the turn and the river, you use 4%. And that's the whole rule. Uh, it was, I'm sure someone figured it out before, but he was nice enough to coin it and write it in his book, which is why I'm giving him credit for it. Um, so some examples of these are if you have a low pair and you're trying to get three of a kind by the turn or the river, you have two outs. And if you're trying to figure out your chance of making that three of a kind on the turn, you do two out times 2% for a total of 4% to make your hand. Simple enough. Other common examples are flush draw, which should be nine outs to give you odds of nine divided by 47 or about 18%. An inside straight draw is four outs to give you odds of four out of 47 or 8%. And you can see this is the exact calculation, but it's really very close to just multiplying by two. So back to pot odds. Um, your break even is when EV is zero. That's a common theme that we're gonna be go uh, talking about. So the bet is X into a pot of 380. Your chance of hitting the flush is nine times 4% or 36%-ish. We're assuming that we get to see both cards. Why do I think we're gonna to get to see both cards? Because he's all in and he can't bet anymore. So our win percentage is 36%. Our exact win rate is 34%, showing that this is pretty close. Like we didn't actually need to do any, any heavy math to get a good ballpark number. So the question here is we're facing a bet of 370. The um, pot before we face that bet is 380. And the question is, should we call? Um, because you're not gonna, you can solve the threshold conceptually um, just to get a resilient solution set, especially when you're doing things um, before or after the fact. But in real time, um, we're gonna want a rule for how to figure this out. So let's talk through this one and then we'll go through the solution on the next slide. Um, so we have to figure out whether to call this. So how many, so what are we drawing to? 
Yeah, so we're drawing to a flush. So how many cards will result in a flush here? Nine, right. So there are nine remaining hearts in the deck. And then we get to see one or two cards. Yep, I agree. So we get to see two cards because he's all in. So our chance of winning is 4% times 9. So 9, 18, 36%. So we can call up to 36%. We can contribute up to 36% of the final pod. So where can, we would contribute 370 into the final pod of 2 times this plus 1 times this. And just offhand, you can calculate, you can figure out that's around one third because the pod is about equal to the size of his bet. So we're contributing a little bit less than 33%. So we know that this is gonna be a good call. And that's how you would do this in real time. You would say you're 36% to win, you're contributing 33% of the pot, so you decide to call. And that's how you would, that's how you would make this decision. Um, so let's do a couple more examples. Well, these are all different situations where this type of thing might come up. So here's a situation where we have um, asymmetrical stacks, although the blinds are the same. Um, so we have six, seven of diamonds. I'm using the four color deck just to make it easier to see. Um, something happens pre-flop that doesn't really matter. On the flop, um, there's $320 in the pot. He bets 150. So what do we do here? So what are we drawing to? We're drawing to a straight. So how many, how many, how many outs do we have? How many cards will hit that straight? Eight, yeah, so we got um, four nines and then four fours will make us hit that straight. Um, so eight outs total. So what's our chance of winning this hand based on what we're calling here? Yeah, eight, 16, 32. Yep, I agree with that. Um, so based on that, um, what do we have to contribute to um, stay in this hand? Like what percentage, uh, percentage of the future pot? Yeah, something less than a third, because if he bet exactly 320, that would be a third. So we know this is way less than a third, and since we're 32% to win, this is probably going to be a good call. So going through the questions, so we have an open-ended straight draw, meaning we have eight outs because two different cards would result in the straight. Um, our outs are any nine and any four. We have a 32% chance of hitting it. And what's the correct play? Call, because... 150 out of 620, where 620 is the pot plus 300 is 24%. Okay, so that wasn't bad. So that's our, those are two common draws. One was a flush draw and one was a straight draw. So let's go to something uh, a little bit different. So we have 5-5 five, five on the button. He raises into us. I call. And the flop comes three clubs, five ace, six. He bets 200. Okay, cool. So this is... Um, this is a situation which uh, I'm sure a lot of you may have run into recently. Uh, so what, so what hand are we drawing to here? So what, like what? Why do we think we're behind if we have three fives here? Yeah, like he might have a flush. Um, certainly to the point where I'm not super comfortable with the set here, knowing that, like it's reasonably likely for someone to have a flush here. Or like, even if he doesn't have a flush and we bet, he's only gonna call us really if he has a flush or a better hand. Um, so he has a flush and then what are we drawing to? Like what beats a flush here? Full house, Full house good. What else? Four fives. Uh, yep, four of a kind. Okay, so what are our outs here? Yep, I agree, seven outs, what are they? Yep, so three aces, three sixes, one five, so we have seven outs total. All right, so what, what's our chance of hitting, do we count one or two cards here? One, why? Because he has a lot of chips behind and there's no way if he's betting this on the flop, he's giving us a free card on the turn. Unless for some reason he thinks we have a flush, but we certainly can't count on that. Okay, so we can, what do we say, seven outs? So we use 2% for the next card or 14%. So we can call up to 14% of the future pot. The future pot's gonna be 21, 2300, so we can call 14% of that. So what's a good estimate of that? Like, it's going to be more than like 280, because 14% of 2000 is, is, uh, is 280, right? So he's betting materially less than that. Like he's way under betting whatever he has here. If he has if he has a flush, he's not protecting it. If he doesn't have a flush, like he's losing. 
Um, so this is a very common example of a villain not protecting his hand. Like he's probably, this is a situation where I see a lot of newer players um, screw up. They're not, they're betting so little, like they're betting little because they don't want the other guy to fold, but they're actually losing value because the other guy folding here would be preferable. They should bet enough that he either folds or he makes a wrong decision if he calls. So we're drawing to a full house or four of a kind, which you guys got right. Our outs are three aces, three sixes, and one five for seven cards total. Our chance of hitting the draw is 14%. So the correct play is... Yep, correct play is call because he's only asking us for 9% to contribute 9% of that pot. Since we're 14% to win, like the chunk in that pie is bigger than the 9% chunk that we have to contribute. And the result is this $122 free that he's giving us. Okay, so I think this is my last example. This one should be a little bit more fun. So this is it. So why is this a draw that we're looking at? Like we're the first one to act. Why does this matter? Can anyone tell what's going on here? Yeah, so the villain here is all in blind with that 200, because that's the big blind. So by calling here, or by doing anything, we're going, like he is going all in. So really, it's like he acted before us, and now we're deciding whether we want to act. So what are we drawing to here? <coughs> well, okay, so what are, what are we facing? What does he have in terms of a range? Any two cards. And then, so what are we drawing to? In general, we're drawing to basically anything. Like, we're hoping that we win some amount of the time. And what percentage do we have to win? Okay, what, first let's start with like, what's a reasonable estimate for the amount we could win? The percentage of the time. So like, what, what are some um, hand versus hand percentages that you know? Like, okay, so what's, like, what's aces versus anything? Yeah, it's like 80 or 85%. And then if he doesn't have a pocket pair higher than both of our cards, like you're generally, like even if you're dominated, you're like 70, 30. And then the majority of random versus random is like between 60, 40 in either direction. Um, so say that what percentage of the time do we have to win here for this to be a good call? So what, what's the size of the bet that we're facing here if we're the small blind? 100, right? Right, so we're contributing 100 here to win a pot of 400, which is going to be the one, like one big blind from each of us. So if we're more than 25% to win here, like this is a plus EV call. And I see a lot of people screw this up for some reason. But you're virtually always ahead of 25% here. So what we're drawing to here is anything and our chance of hitting the draw is we're actually about 40% versus his range. And even three, two, like the worst heads up hand versus any two cards is 32%. So we're really calling blind there. Like we are, we are always ahead of his range. So the correct play is certainly gonna be to call and the EV is like 60. So if we fold this, it's worth about 60 chips. Um, so let's talk about imply out odds. So the, um, the solution to an implied odds question is the number of chips that we have to win after hitting our draw. So um, I I'm using that specific language because like for pot odds, the solution is like whether or not you can call or what's the maximum bet you can call. For implied odds, it's different. It's the number of chips you have to win later to make the call good. It's the amount, it's the amount of basically dead money you need to add to the pot after the fact. Um, so the way that we do that is we take a look at our percentage chance of winning, say it's 20%, and then we figure out what size would the pot have to be to make the bet we are currently facing be 20% of that pot. So here's an example, and we're using easier numbers here because we're dividing by percentages. Um, so say we have a flush draw and we're 18% to hit. Um, if the pot is 300 and we have a bet of 180 into us, um, our call is going to be 27% of the pot. So if we had a 27% chance of winning, that would be a break-even call, but we don't. We have an 18% chance of winning. So by pot odds, it says don't call. But 
to figure out what the amount is that we um, we could we want the pot to be, we just divide that 180 by the 18% of our odds to get this 1,000 number. So if the pot were 1,000, we could make that call. So the um, the solution here is this 340 difference, which is the real the actual pot after we call. Um, the difference between that and the pot that we need to make this call neutral. That's where this this, this 340 comes from. And it's gonna, it has to be in, in dead money. It has to be money that's added to the pot after we already hit our um, flush. So to visualize it, um, so we need that bet of 180 from the example I just gave to be 18% of the pot. That's what makes it a good bet. Um, as of the time that we make the decision, our bet here represents 27% of that pot. However, if we can increase the pot by 340, that bet would be 18% of that new pot. So that gives us the, the right implied odds to make this call. And what we need to figure out is whether this 340 number is realistic, the difference between this 1,000 and that 660. So are, are we following that? Is that making it easier to understand um, what we're trying to figure out when we do an implied odds question? Okay, cool. So I think I have two or three examples here um, just to, to walk through that idea. Um, so, so here's a hand. Okay, so, so here's a decision we're facing, um, and we need to figure out whether this is a, a good call. So we have plenty of chips behind, we, we, have, we all started with 1,000, and then like we're probably not winning this hand because we have middle pair. Okay, so we're drawing to two pair or three of a kind. Our outs are these, which are five outs total, which gives us a chance of hitting our draw of what? So do we get to see one or two cards? Uh, right, we get to do one card because presumably he's going to bet again. So we multiply by 2% to get a 10% chance of hitting the draw. And then let's go back to, the, um, to this. So what does a pot have to be to make this bet 10% of the future pot? It needs to be, well, it needs to be 1,000 because we, we're contributing 100 of some pot that we have 10% equity in. So it needs to be 1,000, which means how much additional money do we need to add after we call that. So it's going to be, so after this call, it's going to be 100, 475, 575, because we're, like, we're calling 100. So that's going to be in the pot too. And then we, it's the delta between that and 1,000 that we care about. So it's going to be uh, 1,000 minus 575. We need, to, we need to draw 425 in addition at the end. So we have a 10% chance of hitting. Our odds are 16%, meaning we can't call it there. However, if we can pull out um, that 100 bet divided by the 10% odds that we need, it creates a $1,000 pot with a difference of 575. So we need $425 more on that uh, after we hit our draw to make that a good call, which in that situation seems reasonable. Like he, so he bet 100 into a pot of, of 400. Presumably he'll bet like 200 or 300 next hand. And then we can repop him for anything. And if he, even if it's a min bet, which he'll presumably be obligated to call, especially because this is a very, um, like a very hidden draw, um, we'll be able to, to make this a good call. So I, I think this is reasonably a good call based on, uh, I think we could get four or $500 more at least. So, so let's do another one of these. So I'm going to make these all from the same position and all the preflop actions the same, just to make it um, simple to see what's going on. OK, so here, um, let, let's go through the same steps. So what are we drawing to here? Yeah, so several things. So we're, we're drawing to a straight. We're drawing to a flush, or we're drawing to anything else. So, okay, I would agree we're drawing to a royal flush also. And I'm going to say the over pair might not be good. Like one pair, I, I wouldn't consider a great hand, especially when we're, what, what we're blinds here? Like um, 50 to 100, so we have an M of like, what, like 50? Something like that. So I think it's, 
Uh, I think our M is our, our our top pair is not that great here. Um, but I do think the flush is good. Probably like a king high flush is good, and the straight is good too. So how many outs do we have here? So how many like how many outs to the flush? Right. So we have yeah nine other clubs in the deck, and then how many outs to the straight? Eight, right. So we have 17 outs, and then how many are overlaps? Two, right. So let me make sure I got that right. So 9 plus 8, 17, minus 2, yep, 15. So we have 15 outs here. And then how many cards are we going to see? We're going to see one. The only, I, I really wouldn't estimate that we're going to see two cards unless someone is specifically all in. So use one, um, one card here. So we have... Um, so 15 outs over one card. So what's the percent chance of winning on that next card? 30%. Good. So what, how much, so what would the pot have to be eventually to make this a good call with our 30% chance of winning this hand? I, so it would be, so I think it would be 600 divided by 30%. Right? So what's that? So 600 divided by 3 over 10? No, I think it's going to be more than that because we're going to multiply by 10 thirds. So it's going to be 6,000 divided by 3 or 2,000. Would you agree with that? So this pot has to be 2,000 by the end. And then what is, what's it going to be when we call here? Yeah, let's see. So it's going to be 600, his 600 plus our 600, 1,200 plus 275. Yeah, 4, uh, 1,475. So how, mu how many additional dollars do we need in the pot after hitting one of our draws? Good, right. So I think that's right. Um, so drawing to straight or flush, any ace, any nine, seven other clubs that aren't ace or nine for 15 outs. We are 30% to hit this. Um, so right now the pot odds are 40% because he's betting 600 or we'd be contributing 600 into a total pot of 1475. We need to win an additional 525 after to make this a good call. So that's it. So that, that's how you do implied odds. Just make sure you understand um, what the future pot has to be, and then you can use your own judgment for whether um, that's a realistic amount to win here. I think like here, 500 is totally reasonable because he already bets 600. Even if even if a if a flush comes, he's probably um, pretty obligated to make at least another five hundred dollar bet, or at least a five hundred call if he checks. So I think that's good. So I think we have a okay. To to make it a little simpler for you guys, I made explicit all of the formulas that we went over for drawing, um, just to help with the case. So our normal EV formula is just so X is always going to be what we're solving for. Our EV is just the like the either benefit or cost of the decision that we're facing. It's just going to be the the combination of our win percent and loss percent, and the win amount and loss amount. How you determine pot odds is just a decision rule: yes or no. Do you make this call? It's just your your win percentage uh, of the hand, the chance of you hitting your draw, whether that's greater than the call amount divided by the pot plus two times the call amount because the bet and amount and call amount are the same thing. If, that, if it is greater, then you make the call. If it's less, then you fold. Um, implied odds, which we just went over, it's going to be the bet amount you're facing divided by your chance of winning the hand minus whatever the pot's going to be after you make that call. I think that's it. Okay, so these are all the formulas you need to make these decisions. Um, you can generally remember them when you're at the table. I think they're like, I think they're fairly intuitive, and if not, they seem pretty easy to memorize. Anyway, so let's do a live example of this. this uh, so this hand happened at the World Series of Poker last year when it was 10-handed, which means it was one hand before the, the bubble where you, uh, the final table bubble where they get to, how it works in the World Series is they play down to nine, and then like they have a break for three months where they build up the final table and they advertise it and they play it live. So this is a situation that was very tense for these guys, and an interesting hand happened, which I think is a great example of what we're trying to do. Anyway, so let's watch. Very first year of the World Series in 1970, no final table. Champion determined by a vote of all the players. Johnny Moss was the winner. Under the gun, Martin Jacobson, ace jack of clubs. Very accomplished tournament player, four World Series final tables. 
raise. The dealer announces raise, but I don't think Martin has the right denominations out there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold the action, hold the action. Just call, just call. So they're making it just a call for 300000 By the way, that was World Series Dealer of the Year Andy Tillman. Frankly, I think the Dealer of the Year thing has gone to his head. He's dealing with a lot more attitude now. One of these players will join the likes of John Hewitt, Jordan Smith, and Don Barton as main event 10th place finishers. Action on William Tonking. Jack nine in the small blind. He wants to play. He limps in. Nope. In the big blind, Dan Sindelar checks his option. Three for a bargain. And here is our flop. Seven, eight, ten, two clubs talking with a jack high straight. He checks it to Sindelar. Middle pair with a gut shot. And he's reaching for chips. Bets a half million. Jacobson with flush and straight draws. If Jacobson raises under the gun as he intended to, Tonking likely would have folded. Instead, they're now on a massive collision course that could define the November 9. Jacobson obviously loves his hand with straight and flush draws. Unfortunately, he's run into Tonking, who flopped a straight. But there is a raise to a million seven fifty. So the 2% hand bets and the second worst hand raises. Lon, this is a game I need to be in. <laughs> A dream scenario for the short stack that still could turn into a nightmare for William Tonking. All in. And Tonking all in. announces all in. Sindelar folds. So let's figure out what's going through his head right now. So here are all of our players. That's our hero with ace jack clubs. It's a little hard to see uh, when they broadcast it on TV, but he was under the gun. He called. Uh, called around, he bet, he raises, he check raises all in, and now Jacobson facing um, a decision here. So, uh, clearly, what is he drawing to? Flush. And then, like, if he hits that flush, is he going to win? Probably. And then, what else is he drawing to? Straight. straight, right. And then, if he hits that nine, he's probably going to win with the straight. Although, not all the time, because he doesn't have the best straight. If a nine comes, and then... This guy has like uh, queen king, or sorry, uh, jack queen, he's gonna actually lose. So I'm calling, um, so the question is what does he do here? This is what it looks like. Um, so our hero here raises uh, 1750, he re-raises 4525 more um, to being all in for 6275. Uh, okay, so he's drawn to a flush and possibly a straight. So how many are out, outs do we have? So you can count like partial outs. You can say, I'm going to win half the time if I get this, just to be conservative. So you can say, all of these clubs are good because you, you have the best possible flush. And maybe like this nine will work. So let's count it as half a card, like half an out. We'll win half the time if we do that. So we have 10 and a half outs. So our chance of hitting the draw, how many cards do we get to see? Because you can, you can just say, if we hit this nine, we're, we're gonna win half the time. We're probably gonna win more than that. But it's a situation where like, if he has a jack, we, we split. And if he has jack queen, we lose. So I'm not really comfortable calling those complete outs. And in the end, it, it, you can see it doesn't really matter. But the more conservative move is just saying, half the time we'll win with those. And with these nine outs, we're gonna win all the time. Like you could just count them as half outs or you, you can count them as two thirds outs or something like that. Anyway, so we get to see both cards because he's all in. Have a question? No, uh, we lose if he has Jack Queen. Yeah, that's right. This is a conservative play. This is like a really good, uh, like this is the worst case. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Like if we, if, if this says call, then we're definitely calling. It, it just, it's a real pain to like have aggressive estimates and then it says call and you need to wonder whether your estimates are wrong. So this gives us um, a, a more clear example. Anyway, so the correct play is going to be to call here. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, but we're going to say that what's in the pot are all the bets that happened before he was re-raised. So that's um, the original pot of 1400, that one guy that bet 500 for some reason, and then 
this, which would be our all-in call, which is um, uh, the 6275 times 2, because he bet that and we called that. This was a small blind. I don't know if you saw. The, the, um, the small blind here just called 500 and then folded when, um, when he bet into him. So that's dead money in the pot. Um, so the total amount is 14,450, and we're facing a bet of 45,25. So 31% of the pot we're contributing. We're 42% to hit our draws, meaning that this is a pretty clear call. And when we do the EV, even with this conserv conservative um, estimate, um, it says we're making about like one and a half million chips from making this call. So this should be pretty easy. Um, let's see what happens, and let's see if this works. All in. And talking all in. announces all in. in. Sindelar folds. Jacobson's got 20 million. This is for 15% of his stack. He's not going anywhere. I call. Martin calls Martin with his draws ball. to winner. Chop. Talking is the one on the hook. So sick that you didn't raise. Wow. So sick that you didn't raise, and then this, this flop comes. Yeah. I mean, how's that happen? Pretty brutal to flop the nuts and only be 56%. Talking's got to fade Jacobson's hand and an entire group of players and railbirds here who want to see him knocked out so we have our November 9. What a moment. This is probably the right flush draw to fade. Talking has to sweat it. Five of diamonds. Jacobson still looking for that knockout card. Jacobson a lot more relaxed than Talking, understandably. If Jacobson hits a club, talking is gone, and we have our November 9. The river card is a diamond! And so, talking secures the pot. We continue 10 handed. Nice time. Thanks. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so, so he won that. The guy, uh, Jacobson, I'm pretty sure I ended up winning the World Series that year. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of be carefuls. Do not draw to a hand that may not actually win when you hit it, which means if you're drawing to a flush that's not even that good and may be dominated by another flush, you probably shouldn't count that at all those as full outs. Or like the lower end of a straight is really, really bad. It's really common for people to draw to that and then just go broke because they think they made their hand, but as it turns out, they made the second best hand. Um, in addition, don't draw to a worse made hand than is already possible. So people refer to something called a paired board, which means uh, two cards on the board have the same number. Um, where that means that four of a kind or full house are possible. So if you're drawing to a, uh, a straight or a flush, you might not even win. You might be like drawing dead is what it's called. You, like you might be 0% to win that hand. So be careful on drawing on a paired board. In addition, do not assume you get to see both cards. It's really common for players to think that, okay, there are two cards left, he doesn't seem too aggressive, I'll probably get to see both cards for cheap, and then find out that like, their, their assumptions when calling the, the flop ended up being really bad and costing them EV. So very rarely does someone check the turn. Like if they bet the, unless the turn is really scary, like you hit your draw obviously, or it looks like you did, no one's gonna give you that for free. Um, another thing to be careful about is don't overestimate how easy it is to extract additional chips. Like, it's really, really obvious when someone hits a flush draw because like, there aren't that many reasons people are gonna call a bet on the flop when there are two clubs on it and then um, bet when another club hits on the turn. Like flushes are really obvious and everyone is keeping an eye on that. Straights are less obvious because like, a lot of different boards can have a straight on it. Um, so they can't really just assume that you're gonna have a straight if there are any like four cards that are near each other by the turn. Um, and sets, like when you have a pocket pair and you hit a third of that pair on the turn, are basically invisible. There's no way they can put you on that. So your implied odds for sets are huge, whereas your implied odds on flush draws are very, very small. Um, in addition, on the other end, if you have a made hand, don't bet so little to give them the odds to, to reach their draw. Basically, most of your flop and turn bet should be like two thirds of the pot, just to punish them to, um, if they want to chase their draw. Okay, so that's it for implied odds. So let's move on to fold equity. Um, so here's an example.
Okay, so were you guys following what's going on in that hand? Basically, um, I had position uh, pre-flop to make this call. Then on the flop, I had, open, I had an open in a straight draw. He bet small enough that I should call. Um, same thing on the turn. I think he checked behind me on the turn. And the river he checks. Why? Why is he checking the river here? So he's checking because he's worried. Like, he knows I'm drawing to something because I flat called. And look, I could have been drawing to a flush and he thinks I just hit it. So this is a perfect bluffing opportunity because we are representing, like, we are basically representing a flush. So the question is, how often does this have to work to be a good bet versus just kind of checking behind and losing nothing? Um, with bluffing, like we can, if it's a bad bet, we're just gonna lose money most of the time. So we have to figure out what proportion of the time does this have to win to make it worth it? And that's what we're gonna be looking at here. And the, uh, the, the concept that will give us the value of making this bet is called fold equity. So fold equity is the value that you're getting in a hand from the likelihood that the other player is going to fold. So with regard to fold equity, I'm saying your showdown value, which is this uh, acronym here, is, is zero. Like you, you can't win at showdown, which is our situation there. Like if he calls us, we definitely, definitely, lo definitely lost. So the formula for this is, at least the EV formula is just, so it's the derivation of the normal EV formula that we always see. It's just the pot, times your chance of winning, i.e. his fold percentage, minus the, ch the chance of losing. And you lose that bet if you lose. Like you're risking the bet to win the pot. If we have the chance to win after he calls, we could add another variable where just, instead of us just losing this bet um, for the amount he calls of the time, when he calls, we're gonna get some amount of EV, which is still presumably gonna be negative, but it's gonna be less negative than just losing the entire bet. So that, that's the basic formula for, for semi-bluffing here. So I'm defining bluffing is um, a bet where it has positive expectation because the fold equity is more than zero. Like just this term, like just the, the proportion of the pot that you expect to win from him folding is greater than the chance of you lose, the, the weighted chance of you losing that bet. That's just gonna be called a bluff, an outright bluff. And I differentiate that from semi-bluffing where this is actually negative. Where if you have a 0% chance of winning, it's actually a bad bet because he calls you more times than makes that valuable. But a semi-bluff actually becomes positive expectation because of your showdown win percentage. Your showdown win percentage is, um, it's sufficiently high to offset it. And this is where the value comes from because you have the opportunity to steal pots, but you also have the opportunity to redraw to a winning hand. Um, and that's why in tournaments, this becomes something that you're gonna be doing very often because you're not gonna always have made hands, but you're always gonna have something that could become a made hand and that becomes good enough. So how often does this have to work to be profitable? So um, I'm just gonna give you a formula here. So we're betting 150 into a pot of 350 where we have no chance of winning if he calls. Our EV, which is just taking from that formula, is 350 times the chance we fold minus 150 our bet times the chance he calls. So we can solve this for um, EV equals zero and solve for fold to get this formula. We get 150 divided by the pot plus our bet. So this is our bet because the idea is that we are putting 150 into that pot for a chance of winning the whole pot back. Like we, he won't add that 150 to the pot if we win it. So that's the idea there. So it's our bet divided by the pot after we bet to give us our, our neutral EV fold percentage. So that's the, chance he, that's the chance of him folding that makes us a good bet. So I think this is pretty, like this is pretty cool. Like you can use this to determine what's a good bluff and what's a bad bluff by just saying, is he gonna call this more than one third of the time? And just the EV calculation, looking at um, using this formula to prove that um, we reach a, a neutral EV is just 30% times this 350, the pot minus 70% him calling times our bet. That equals zero. And that's our quick, I like plugging this back into the EV formula just to make sure we did, like we, we messed around with the variables properly. So are we, are we okay with this so far? Because we're gonna move on to something a little bit more complicated. In this one, he bets 75 like he did before, but we are raising 150. Why? Why are we raising 150 here rather than just calling? 
Yeah, because we have an open-ended straight draw where even if he calls, we still could win. And that fundamentally changes um, what we need to make this profitable. So here, our chance of winning is 16%, eight times two. We get to see just the river. So that's 150 into a pot of 350, where our win percent is 16. This is still our chance of taking another pot uncontested. And then the one minus F percent, the chance that he calls, is multiplied by our, our marginal EV. This 16% times winning the pot, 500 is 150 plus 350. 150 our bet, 350 uh, the pot, minus 150 our bet. I guess the 150 here would be his bet. But still, we have, a, we have a chance to win 500 or lose 150. One of the reasons fold equity is really hard to teach is because there's no real intuitive way to memorize this formula. Like, so what I did here is I just solved for um, EV equals zero um, for our fold percentage. So we can solve this. I, I just plugged this into Wolfram Alpha and I got like the neutral fold percentage is 12 um, compared to like here, we need to win this bluff 30% of the time, and here we need to win 12% of the time. That shows the value of the semi-bluff here. So to check with EV, you win 350, 12% of the time, and 88% of the time, you have to deal with this. So that, that shows, at least intuitively, what the value is. But let's see if we can figure out exactly um, what, like how important this win percentage is. So. Let's use, okay, so we're gonna have to use calculus for this. So when we, um, when we graph this formula, we see a clear trend, and like, it would be intuitive. When, you're, when your showdown win percentage goes up, the amount you need him to fold goes down. Like, if you win 0% of the time, he needs to fold a lot, but then if you win some amount of the time, he only needs to fold a smaller amount of the time. So that's what this thing is saying, and there are a couple of interesting points on this graph which I wanna point out. So what's this point here? It's, it's our, it's our break-even uh, fold percentage for having a zero EV. So the idea is if he folds, how you read this is, um, if we have a 16% chance of winning, if we're drawing to uh, an open-ended straight for one card, if he folds more than 12% of the time, if we're in anywhere in this area, it's, it's positive EV. And if we're anywhere down here, it's not. So, so that's how we're reading this graph here. So what about this point here? It's a complete bluff because we have 0% chance of winning. And do you recognize this 30? It's from all the way back here. It's when we had a 0% chance of winning. So that's that point up there, which I think is pretty interesting. But it gets even cooler. OK, so that's what that is. It's our 150 divided by 150 plus uh, 350, which is our formula for determining what our break-even fold percentage is for a complete bluff. That's our 30% here. But check this out. So what is this number? It's our pot odds break-even. It's the size of the bet that we could call if he was betting to make us neutral EV. That's what this 23 is. It's the, our 150 divided by the pot after our call. What that means is if he folds 0% of the time, I i.e. like similarly to if he just bet and then we have the option to call, that makes us zero EV. So this, like, this graph connects all of those variables for us. And that lets us derive something very interesting with regard to implied odds. We can just figure out how implied odds impacts our fold percentage by looking at this secant line and coming up with a good estimate. So let me work through this graph, uh, talk through what we're seeing here, because I think this is really cool. So um, to be clear, this blue line is um, our neutral fold percentage, right? And then this slope is, it's the derivative of how much um, of like a bonus we get to fold percentage for every 1% win rate. So for each additional one out, so each additional 2%, he needs to fold 3% less for us to break even there. That's what this is telling you. When you have a 10% chance of winning, you, ha uh, you, ha uh, you just reduce um, this amount by 15%. You multiply it by the one and a half slope. Although it undershoots it by a little bit, like it gives you a very, very close estimate to, to using these implied odds in, uh, in real time. And so I went ahead and figured out, okay, so that's for a specific like bet size. How's it work if we look at um, for a much bigger bet or a much smaller bet? I found something really interesting. 
When the bet becomes, when we go towards infinity, the partial derivative is two. Like you only get as much of a bonus as two times your win percentage. So each additional out gives you like an 8% reduced um, break even for fold percentage. And then when your bet approaches zero, you only get a 1% decrease. So these are our bounds. Like um, for a pot size bet, it's one and a half percent your bonus. And um, regardless, you know your bonus is gonna be between one and two, at least in terms of the average across um, win percentages. That's what we discovered here. And what this is letting us do is, it's less letting us create a quick rule that implements implied odds. Um, so to go over what these rules exactly are, um, let's back up to a complete bluff. So our full percent needed is just the bet divided by the pot and the bet combined. If you think, like, if you want to bet the exact size of the pot, which isn't that bad for a bluff, you only need to win half the time. And then you can, if you want, to scale linearly down to zero. You could just say, all right, if I bet half the pot, I have to win 25% of the time. It's a little bit off, it's like 33% of the time, but it's not that bad. So this gives you a very easy way to determine like when you should bluff or not. And like obviously there's a bit of judgment because you gotta figure out whether this is a reasonable number, but it gives you an idea like you don't need to win that bluff 80% of the time. Um, and then when, like, when you actually have a chance to redraw to win, it becomes even more interesting. Um, so in general, when you have a draw, um, you have a higher, like you, your value is higher because you still have a chance to win the hand. And in general, you're gonna see, like very rarely will people actually make complete bluffs because they will like prefer, like the, the, the chance of you winning the hand at the end materially makes your, your, your value better. Um, so a simple assumption is just each 1% your showdown increases, you, multi, you, in, you decrease your fold percentage by one and a half percent. And your fold percentage are gonna be much, much smaller. They're gonna be like 15 to 20-ish percent, like somewhere in that range. So decreasing that by 5% actually makes you uh, quite a bit more likely to win, or at least have a, um, a positive expectation decision. And when we talk about pre-flop, which is gonna be nothing but figuring out semi-bluffing opportunities, um, we're gonna be heavily using this type of thing. Um, so let's do some uh, examples. Okay, so what is going on here? So just to watch that again, so um, it looks like the villain raised something preflop. I had position, so I called. And then he showed weakness for three streets in a row. Like, I don't know what he has, but it, it seems to be worth taking a stab at it. So like, what proportion of the time does this stab have to work to make it a good bluff. So is this gonna be a bluff or a semi-bluff? Bluff. bluff, why? Yeah, the, like I barely beat the board. I, I think my 10 high plays, but like only very close. So if he, like there's no way he can call this with the worst hand. Um, so the question is, what, like how often does this have to work to be valuable? Which is a very common question you might ask yourself. Um, so do you remember how to figure this out? So the formula is gonna be this. It's just the bet divided by the pot plus the bet. So the difference between this and the pot odds formula is one bet. Pot odds formula is pot plus two bets, ours and his. This formula is just the pot plus our bet only because he never adds his bet in. So to figure out our chance of winning here, let's just go to this one. We just do what? We take the size of our bet and divide it by this plus this number. So we add those together, it's what, five, uh, 625? So we just take 250 divided by 625, which is what? It's 40%, so this needs to work 40% of the time to be valuable. So it's actually not as, like, not as interesting as I would have guessed. Like this needs to work a pretty big amount of time, and given that he's shown so much weakness, he's probably, he's probably guessing that we're probably bluffing. But anyway, if he calls 25% of the time, 
Um, does that make that a good uh, bet or not? Yes, because that means he folds 75% of the time, which is more than our 40. So that makes that a good bet. And just to plug into the EV formula, so what, like, what is our value from this bluff if, if our estimate's right here that he calls 25% of the time? It's $200, so the pot's what? I think the pot's like 400 here. So that makes sense to me that like 75% of the time we're gonna take down that pot, so it's worth about 200 to us. So that's it. Um, let's do another example. Okay, so what's going on? Like something happened on the flop, and then what are we doing here? Exactly, so we're betting 450 into a pot of 775. Like, so the question is, um, like, is this a good bet? Like, should we have done this? And we're gonna, like, we're gonna be facing these decisions all throughout the tournament. Um, so this one is going to be kind of complicated, but not really. Let's see what we can piece together for now. So what, like, what's our chance of winning this one at showdown? So we have a 16% chance of winning. Yeah, it's hard to like, I, I prefer not counting. You, like you can proportion partial out to like uh, whatever you think your real chance of winning if you hit that and just say that's worth like one third of an out. But in terms of being conservative and making this simple, we can just say, let's say we have to hit the straight to win. Although you can consider yourself having a little bit more equity if you just say, maybe I'll win if I hit like a 10 or something. Okay, so we're, we're betting 450 into this pot of 775. So what, um, so we know we have 16% chance of winning this hand uh, if we are called. If we have no percent chance of winning the hand, um, if we are called, what proportion of the time do we need him to fold to make this good? 450 divided by 1225, that 1225 is going to be um, 450 plus 775, is that right? What was it about? Yeah, 450 plus 775 is 1225. Uh, 1325. Um, I think this is um, 11, 12, 25. I think that's right. 1225, okay, so we have a 37% chance of, of um, that's our break even if we have no chance of winning. But then we get a bonus for the 16% chance of, of us winning. And then a general estimate's gonna be one and a half times because we're making approximately a pot size bet we're making it a little bit smaller, so maybe this is overdoing it by a little bit, but this is at least giving us an okay estimate. Like, this might be a little low, it might be like 18%, but like, we can't differentiate between the, like, a margin that small. Um, so the 16% chance is related to our chance of winning. We get a bonus that's proportional to that. I'm saying one and a half, which is, like, seem to be, like, about in the ballpark, to give me a 13% chance break even for that fold rate. So even if he calls 80% of the time, it makes it a good bet. And 80% is a huge amount considering, um, I, I don't remember the situation. Like, he could potentially have nothing here. Like, he definitely showed some sort of weakness, so it's totally reasonable that he won't call more than 80% of the time there. Um, so we can calculate our equity just based on the formula earlier, which is our chance of taking the pot down uncontested, 20% and then our 80% chance of winning 16% of the time and losing 84% of the time, where we're winning the pot plus his bet, and we're losing our bet. So, okay, so let's jump to uh, another live example. Junior world champion in bowling and horseshoes for Pappas, foosball, and maybe poker. Sorry, what's your name? Mark. Mark yeah. Billy. Good Mark already played to the final table of the WSOP. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, sorry. I, I have no idea. Listen. Billy is world champion in another sport. That guy's pretty cool too. What sport? In the game. Football. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome as well. Huh? Yeah, that is awesome. I'm a world that's champion. Really this really is really considered really very really high quality yeah. banter by Google awesome. standards. <laughs> Trip. Uh, I got, we got to play sometime. The secret's out? Absolutely. <laughs> it's all good, buddy. Jacob's in the pocket seven. That's a 650. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Confirming with Sindel, yeah, that's 650 and that's a raise. 
Bolitano, 10 Trey suited into the muck. Two Pappas now with Ace Queen. I wonder if there are different surfaces in foosball, like the French Open of foosball, the Wimbledon of foosball. <laughs> and is there an Ace Queen in foosball? Yeah, right. The worst joke ever. There are several brands of championship tables. Billy's a tornado guy, by the way. Tornado. And Billy with Ace Queen re raises to a million four twenty five. The main event's a grind, but Billy Pappas says he doesn't get tired here because he's used to foosball tournaments, which are 14 hours a day on your feet for several days. Newhouse messily folds. The Ace of Hearts is exposed. So action now. Back to Jacobson. Jacobson trying to become the first Swede to make the main event final table since Chris Bjorn in 1997. Bjorn tied for sixth all-time in World Series caches. Bjorn and Jacobson, both born in Sweden, both moved to London. Jacobson made the call. We're heads up. King Jack Trey. Jacobson ahead still with the sevens. Pappas picks up a Broadway draw. Jacobson checks. So let's take a look at what actually happened before we got to where we paused. Okay, so this guy's in position. He's on the he, he's in the cutoff position. Um, Jacobson raises. He repops with ace queen in position. Um, Newhouse throws out an ace for some reason. Um, so Jacobson checks, and then he's going to make this standard bet. So the question is, like, is this a good bet? And then um, something we can definitely figure out is what percentage of the time does this have to be a fold to make this a good bet? If showdown win percentage is zero, it's going to be 1,800 divided by the pot plus 1,800 his bet, 33%. But if he actually has a chance of winning, like he has an inside straight draw, he has a, a 10, and then he has the best possible straight, um, he gets at 8% of the time, reducing his win rate by approximate, or his break-even fold percentage by approximately 8%. So it's 8 times 1.5, 12. Um, so this minus 12 is at 21%. And then this is solving it out exactly. I give him half outs for an ace. Like maybe ace wins half the time. It turns out that 21% is basically dead on. So let's see what happened. King Jack Trey. Jacobson ahead still with the sevens. Pappas picks up a Broadway draw. Jacobson checks. Of course, Bruno Politano trying to become the first Brazilian to make the main event final table. Lot. What happens to the Canadians? Our record 10 bracelets in 2013. None this year. Persona non grata Canadian. I think they got too cocky. <laughs> and now Pappas comes out with his draw for a million eight. Pappas was rather aggressive earlier in the main event, again showing his aggressive side right now. Martin folds, Pappas will drag the pot. Now he sits just shy of 20 million. A world champ in two different games. It just could very well be. Billy Pappas makes good use of that scary board to take down the pot. Okay, so, so that's a very common type of bet, which we'll talk about later. That's called a continuation bet. So we showed aggression pre-flop. It's checked him on the flop. Like, it's almost always going to be the right move to bet again on the flop because you already, like, you're already indicating that you have a good hand and then two face cards show up. Like, it's reasonably likely that you're going to have at least top pair there. So it's uncommon for the other guy um, to try to push up against you since, like, presumably you have at least a pair of kings or jacks most of the time. Oh, let's do some be careful about. Um, okay, so... Um, don't, like, th this is a lot of stuff I noticed from the, the more recent tournaments. So don't bet too little on a bluff. That makes it very obvious, and then it's usually pretty clear. Um, like, if, if you bet one-third of the pot, which is something that's generally not common uh, for, for normal players, it, it kind of screams that you're not too attached to the hand. Like, for... And like a two-thirds of the pot bet only really needs to win a small percentage of time to be profitable. I get that no one likes to lose money on a bluff, but one-third bet um, works much less of the time um, than a two-thirds, and you actually get much less value out of it. Um, okay, so bet enough, bet like you had a normal hand. Like bet enough that if someone is drawing to something, they don't have the, the odds to make that call. Um, alternatively, don't bet too much on the bluff. And like, I'm making pretty wide ranges here, so don't think that uh, I'm contradicting myself here. The, the, one of the biggest tells for a bluff is someone betting more than the pot, just because it, it means they didn't actually think through the numbers, and they're just like, I wanna bet a lot, so that makes the other guy fold. Um, but in general, don't bet too much, and by too much, I mean uh, more, than the, more than the pot. 
Um, in addition, if you're short stack, don't bluff an amount that if he raised, you have to call anyway. Um, in which case, you should just um, you should just uh, bet all in there. Um, so don't be afraid of getting caught bluffing. So this is the reason like people don't bluff live is because they're afraid of showing down nothing. Like don't. Don't, like, don't worry about that. One of the best indications to me of someone being a good player is they'll bluff and show down a bad hand and just be like, yep, like, that's how you play poker and that'll be the end of it. So like, don't worry about, like what you have when you bluff is completely immaterial. So just having a losing hand that's really bad is no different than having a marginal losing hand. So don't be afraid of being caught bluffing, um, especially live. Like People get embarrassed when they get caught bluffing. Don't worry about it. Don't, so semi-bluffing is great compared to bluffing because you have a chance of winning uh, the hand. Um, but if you're in position, sometimes it's better just to take a free card. Like if he shows weakness and checks into you when you have an open-ended straight draw, like in some cases it's just going to be right to check and get your free card. You have to compare your EV of checking to your EV, your EV of bluffing. And don't bluff calling stations because a, like, a lot of your value from these guys will come from value betting. And a lot of, like, the only way you'll possibly lose to them if you try to bluff them. And, like, you might uh, be in a situation where you want to, like, you, you're ready to run over calling stations, but you don't have good cards, and bluffing is not the way to go. So don't do that. Um, let's wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>